Most of you who will know me will know that MRI and uh, right ventricular abnormalities is something I've been very passionate about for about more than 10 years, um, almost as passionate as uh, my following of the Indian cricket team. I feel more confident about saying that since Sandpaper Gate. Um, anyway, um, I want to give you three vignettes, three little cases that really illustrate the strengths of MRI. And before I do that, I just want to give you that clinical algorithm. You know, Greg gave Imra a little bit of a hard time about his anxiety with MRI. And I want to say that we're all echo people first, and it's the value add of MRI in solving clinical problems where echo or cath uh, may not be able to solve it completely. And I think that's where MRI fits. So 15 years ago, the algorithm would have been, we have echo to play with and cath to play with to solve clinical problems. Um, and most of the time we could do it, but we recognized that actually there were some problems where a middle tier of imaging was really important to have to solve some problems, um, not all. But the right ventricle is one of those very challenging areas where um, cross-sectional imaging can have a real value add. And I hope that by the end of this talk, you'll be convinced about that. Um, we've already seen that the cine imaging um, has very, very large fields of view. That's very important. We have unrestricted imaging planes. So if we're looking at particular aspects of the right ventricle, we're not limited by operator dependency or angle which an ultrasound beam might be. So we're seeing the entire body, we're shifting around in different phases, we're interactively planning. We have very high spatial resolution, which is really important for the right ventricle. And we're able to appreciate the physiology and the anatomy in one go. And so the hallmarks of the RV are really going to be, as Imra has shown, the sequential nature of being able to slice through the right and left ventricles and demonstrate good function. And so through this talk, it's going to be the volumes through the right and left ventricle, plus appreciating the physiology, so the phase contrast imaging. So what this is showing you in, in this slide is that you can see the pulmonary valve leaflets in the top left-hand corner, and us being able to use phase contrast imaging, which actually velocity encodes every proton and looks at the flow up the pulmonary artery and then down the pulmonary artery in systole and diastole, and allows us to produce these plots and looks at the flow in the great vessels and allows us to understand if there's any shunt physiology or if there's any unusual flow. So typically, if you're a 100 kilogram man or woman, you will produce one mil per beat out of your aorta and pulmonary artery. And so the left ventricle will usually produce 100 mils to match that 100 mils in the aorta. And then the right ventricle will see 100 mils and then there'll be 100 mils through the pulmonary artery. So this is a QPQS of one. This is a totally normal uh, person's flow. So I want you to look at these curves, understand these numbers as normal, and we'll use them to solve a couple of cases. So if case one, um, real case, a 43-year-old guy who was referred to us with a family history of sudden cardiac death and had a recent syncope. The right ventricle was noted to be dilated on the echo, but not very dilated. And in fact, there was not a lot of emphasis, not a lot of detail known about the sudden cardiac death. But naturally, because of the dilated right ventricle, what appeared on the form was, um, could this be a shunt? Could this be ARVC? Could this be some other um, uh, problem? So the kind of volumes that we would generate is the right ventricle, the end diastolic indexed volume is 115 mils per meter squared. So normally up to about 100 mils per meter squared would be acceptable. So this is probably 10 or 15% above the normal, mildly dilated. The function of the right ventricle is normal. Um, and you can see that playing there in the bottom left-hand screen. But there was a sense from the axial stack that towards the pulmonary artery, just under um, just in the right ventricular outflow tract that there was some unusual uh, wall motion. And you can see here that just under the pulmonary artery, there is this very unusual outpocketing, thinning of the right ventricular outflow tract, which is quite, it normally is quite thin, but there's this paradoxical wall motion, this outpocketing in ventricular systole, which represents this very unusual territory. So very uh, marked regional wall motion abnormality, which is very typical of what we might see with ARVC. And now the criteria have been refined from 1994. So this person having a dilated RV and having regional wall motion abnormality fits one major criteria. This person actually went on to have a defibrillator. And as you hear with lots of anecdotal stories, the day after the defibrillator was implanted, the first 
ever episode of VF occurred in this patient and was appropriately terminated. We've done a lot of review of, to, um, to allay Greg's anxiety, we've looked a lot at MRI criteria and refined it over time. We've, we've um, published our own reproducibility for the right ventricle, which is very, very uh, robust. But with the developments in MRI and then the refinement of the criteria, a lot of the criteria have dropped off in terms of how we attribute them because now they're much more quantitative. So there's less qualitative stuff about does it look a bit abnormal, we'll give it a minor criteria. And so we've seen with that that the negative predictive value of MRI in the context of ARVC is very, very good, very high. And that's why now we have these two new rebate item numbers, the 63395 and 63397, for either patients who have a clinical suspicion based on imaging or symptoms or with a definite family history would warrant an MRI. Okay, so if we take uh, case number two, so this is a 23-year-old gentleman who presents with breathlessness, unusual breathlessness on exertion, um, not a particularly fit guy, but noted to be breathless, has a dilated right ventricle on echo, and the question is, why is the right ventricle dilated? Oops, I'll just go back. Let's see if I can make that play. That's okay, we'll just stay there. So it's not often that I'm going to show you in this talk where the right ventricle, where the MRI doesn't do a good job, but it was identified on the transthoracic that there was an ASD. So in the bottom left-hand panel, you see the right atrium, the left atrium, and you see this little defect. And the phase contrast image on the bottom right is meant to show you a little bit of flow across the atria. Pretty hard to see. So the best way to image ASDs is with an echo, transthoracic or transesophageal echo. But the question was from the echocardiographer was, does this hole allow, explain the significantly dilated right ventricle? And that's where the MRI comes into um, priority or actually can solve the problem. So small structures that are very mobile are not so well imaged with MRI, and that's because of the temporal resolution. It's much more optimal on echo. So in this case, we map the flow through the main pulmonary artery and the aorta. And you know, what you can see from the graph is that the pulmonary artery flow is quite large compared to the aortic flow. So have a look at just the bottom two panels there where it looks at the aortic and the PA stroke volume. Now, the aortic stroke volume is 50 mils and the PA stroke volume is 100 mils. It's twice that. So we ask ourselves, well, what does this mean? This means there must be a left to right shunt. There has to be um, a QPQS of two. So if you look at my little cartoon in the middle, what happens is if we measure the flow down the bottom at the main, um, in the main arteries, you see that if there's 100 mils in that main PA, which is double that of the aorta, there must be a left to right shunt. To then answer the question of where does this shunt actually arise, we use the MRI volumes and match them to the aortic and the pulmonary artery flow. So here the right ventricular stroke volume matches the pulmonary artery flow. And so that tells me that this shunt is pre-tricuspid. This has to be at the atrial level or at the pulmonary mm -hmm. vein level. And the reason for that is because if you look at the cartoon, if the pulmonary artery sees 100 mils and then delivers the pulmonary veins 100 mils, that should enter the left atrium and then there's 50 mils that's stolen across because by the time the right ventricle sees that volume, it's registering 100 mils. So the, the actual shunt has to have occurred before that. That makes sense? So it's occurred at the pre-tricuspid level. So I already know in my mind that once I've contoured these, and we often do these on the fly, that we're looking for something at the atrial level or above. Now, I know from the echo data on the referral that this was a small hole, not necessarily that the size of the hole will tell me exactly how big the shunt is, but I'm going to be looking for something above that level, and that, that ASD doesn't necessarily explain it. The ASD volume, if I want to work that out, is going to be the difference between what the pulmonary artery sees and what the left ventricle has, because that's where the flow's been stolen from. So that extra 50 mils should have ended up down in the left ventricle, but has gone across. And so the difference between the LV, 50 mils, and the PA, 100 mils, is the ASD volume of 50 mils. So we can be very quantitative about how much flow. And so what we actually find is that when we image this person, there are anomalous veins. Most of the right middle and upper pulmonary veins are all coming into the SVC and explain that shunt. 
that's where the additional flow has come. And this is occurring about three centimetres above the SVCRA junction, really difficult to image any other way apart from this kind of cross-sectional imaging. So in the final um, uh, case, I'm going to talk to you about tetralogy of fallow. So my inspiration to really do this is um, from David Selamai's supervision for many, many years. And this slide is uh, one that's well known to most people. And that is that with um, all the great surgery that's occurred in the 70s and 80s, we're now seeing for the first time more adults with congenital heart disease than there are children. So people should be aware in their imaging laboratories that these patients will come to you. You will need an imaging uh, method, a strategy, um, and there are high volume centers, but they often lob into places where people haven't imaged these before. And it's really important that people understand that this is a highly specialized area. Um, these are models of pulmonary artery to, uh, sorry, right ventricular pulmonary artery connections of patients with tetralogy of fallow. They were made by Sylvia Shivano, an engineer I work with at Great Ormond Street Hospital. And it's really to highlight the heterogeneity that exists in tetralogy of fallow, that the RV to PA connections are really, really different. And the ability to uh, tailor a treatment for these patients and to understand their anatomy and physiology is really important. And MRI really helps with that. So this case is a 30-year-old patient who has no symptoms. Um, well, they say they have no symptoms. Like Edwina says, a lot of these patients with some sort of valve problem will often do very little exercise and complain of very little. They say that the, uh, the case note says a repaired tetralogy. There was a 23 millimeter um, conduit that was placed between the right ventricle and the pulmonary artery. And what you see is that there's a lot of pressure load on that right ventricle. So there's that septal flattening, which is indicating a pressure load, and you see the wobble in diastole, which is there's a, a volume load as well. What I put in the middle is our reproducibility data, which we've published in terms of right ventricular volumes. That we've been following patients for more than 10 years with MRI, and our reproducibility is very, very robust. So if you look at that echo um, still up in the top left, you'll see that there's significant flow acceleration, there's significant pulmonary stenosis, and there's also significant pulmonary regurgitation. And how this ends up being measured for us is on the phase contrast data, where you can see that the aortic flow is fairly standard. We've got about 100 mils coming out of that uh, vessel. But with the pulmonary artery, we have a big sweep of 150 mils in systole, and then we've got 50 mils coming as backflow in diastole, and so the pulmonary regurgitant fraction is 33%. So we have moderate plus pulmonary regurgitation. We've got pulmonary stenosis. And again, one of the weaknesses of MRI is where there's turbulence within the main artery, so there's a lot of flow acceleration, then we're unable to map that velocity. So pulse wave cannot be replaced on MRI, and that's because the protons are misaligned. They're all over the place. We're trying to read a signal back. But regurgitation is very easy to map for us because it's usually fairly laminar, especially at the area where we're measuring it up in the great vessel. So we can quantify the amount of regurgitation. We can see the pressure and the volume load. And here are some examples of the type of anatomy that we might see that fits for that type of flow curve. So on the far left is the patient we're talking about. That's a patient with significant pressure load. You can see that the RV to PA connection has a lot of calcium, a lot of black a lot of signal dropout. We don't register any signal. This provides a lot of radial structure, a lot of radial support for a percutaneous pulmonary valve. And then we go out into the branch pulmonary arteries. Whereas the middle panel B is a person who's got some subpulmonary or muscular obstruction in addition to problems at the valve. And if you put a percutaneous valve, for example, into that area, you will, you will fracture that valve. And then on the far right, on the uh, panel C, you'll see someone with very dilated and distensible native pulmonary trunk. And if you try to put a percutaneous valve into that, it might embolize. So it's really important that these are the kids born with the same condition, but have very different types of anatomy. And the patient selection has to be guided by the MRI because these are very difficult to appreciate any other way. The other things that the MRI adds value to in this case is looking distally into the branch pulmonary arteries. So in the middle, you see some nice big branch pulmonary arteries that arborize really well. But then on the right, you see a really fixed focal stenosis at the origin of the right pulmonary artery. So you would probably stent that too, because it just adds to the afterload on the ventricle. There's no point in fixing something at the valve level if you've got more stenosis distally. And again, the ability to visualize that on the MRI is really important. And finally, for the, for the um, implant of the percutaneous pulmonary valve, we need to understand the coronary course. 
So on the, in the left panel, you'll see that the origin of the right coronary artery is fairly anterior and close to the RV outflow tract, and the origin of the left coronary artery is very posterior. That's the typical arrangement, because what we call it is a sort of a clockwise rotation, because that aorta was sort of sucked into the VSD before, that sort of overriding aorta, so you have that usual tilt. But on the right panel, you actually see that there's a single coronary ostia, which arises very close to, at that point there, very close to the pulmonary artery. And if you blew up a balloon in that pulmonary artery, you would squish all of that person's coronary flow. And that would be a fatal outcome. So this is what the percutaneous pulmonary valve looks like. So long before the TAVI valves were being put in, the Melody valve had been put in by David and others. Um, and this is a platinum meridium stent with a jugular bovine valve within it. Um, and so patient selection for this is really important. This is um, some pictures that were taken when I was in London where the 3D model of the MRI outflow tract is being used to guide the implantation of the percutaneous pulmonary valve. So on the right, you see the percutaneous pulmonary valve being blown up in the RV outflow tract. And this is some modeling that Sylvia and others were doing, which is what the patient really wants to know is, tell me about patient, tell me about outcome, um, success of the procedure. So this is modeling because there's such different anatomies, um, how the valve stent would go inside an individual's anatomy. So this is understanding the shear forces within that RV to PA connection. All right, so I hope that with that you've understood that MRI is really a value add tool. It's not there to replace ECHO. We work together and we solve problems. And MRI adds value because of its large fields of view, its really good reproducibility and the ability to understand anatomy and physiology in one study. Thank you.